Tori, are we good to go? Give me a thumbs up. The Monday, July 19th, 2021 regular meeting of the Council of Berkeley. Ms. Mitchell, would you please call the roll? Councilmember Baker. Here, and just for old time's sake, in <laughs> Berkeley. <laughs> Councilmember Blanchard. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Dean. Councilmember Gavin. Here. Councilmember Hennan. Here. Councilmember Price. Here. Mayor Turbrack. Here. Our first order of business is the approval of tonight's agenda. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Support. Motion made by Councilmember Baker with support from Councilmember Blanchard. Are there any changes or corrections? I just looked at the screen now. I have to look around. <laughs> Seeing none, Ms. Mitchell, would you please call the roll on tonight's agenda? Blanchard? Yes. Gavin? Yes. Hennan? Yes. Price? Yes. Baker? Yes. Turbrack? Yes. Uh, at this time, please stand for the invocation and remain standing for the pledge. With us this evening is Pastor Tal Sullivan. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of approaching you and asking for your blessing. God, you desire to bless us, and we thank you that uh, we live in a nation that places itself under you and so in that place we ask for your blessing we ask God for wisdom Lord in a time where there's much division where people are uh, grieving where there's uh, a lot that is going on in people's lives just within our city we pray God for the residents of Berkeley and the business owners of Berkeley and uh, continue to ask that this would be a place where your blessing is obvious and uh, I pray God for our mayor and council and all of our city servants that they would um, do good work Lord that they would uh, be submitted to you and have your wisdom in all that they do I pray your blessing now in Jesus name Amen, Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we have reached the public comment section of our meeting, and please. Bear with me for a moment because this is one of the places where we're going to have a little bit of uh, change with the hybrid system that we have in place right now. So as we did in the past prior to the pandemic, you will be allowed to comment on agenda items as they are being considered. So public comments now uh, is for items that are not included on tonight's agenda. Uh, for those that are in attendance in person, uh, when it, I ask you to please step up to the podium, state your name and city of residence just as you would have previously. For those of us attending virtually, uh, participants in the webcast can utilize the raise hand function by selecting manage participants on the bottom of your dashboard um, and then select more and the moderator will call your name aloud and unmute you when it is your turn to speak. For those that have called in, you can be placed in queue for public comments by selecting star nine uh, when you get uh, when you're prompted there. And the moderator will announce you by the last four digits of your phone number. Uh, and we're going to do this also in order. So we also have email communications that have come in as well. We'll give the clerk an opportunity if there are any of those communications uh, as we get there. So we're going to start with in-person. Then I'm going to go to the clerk. And then I'm going to go virtual. You have the time you need. Is everybody clear? Yes? Good? Any questions? Perfect. We will start with our friends that are visiting with us today. My name is David Lupian Parrish. I am a resident of Berkeley. I've been here for 13 years. Um, I was just here to um, dis or dis talk about how um, I think that the, the council made a mistake in um, 
accepting the consent agreement. Um, I think that the ZBA and the city staff um, did a good job of going through the application and trying to find merit using the information that they had and the stipulations according to the law. And I think that everything was done properly, um, which is what is necessary for the ZBA decisions to be legally binding. Um, and the, the circuit court is only there to discuss the, the how they came up with their, um, their decision. It's, it has to comply with the laws, it has to be based on proper procedure, has to be supported by evidence, and uh, represents a uh, reasonable exercise of discretion. And I think they, I watched the um, ZBA uh, board meeting and I, I feel like they, they did all of that. Um, I'm not sure why the council decided to accept it because that was, the discussion was held in a closed session um, and I, I asked the council to provide uh, explanation or reasoning, um, some sort of guidance as how you guys make these decisions. Um, and I uh, ha didn't get a response or um, I did get one from council member Hen and I appreciate that, but um, I didn't hear from anyone else. Um, I, I feel like that although when there's pending litigation, um, I understand the need to not discuss trial strategy, but once a consent agreement or once that litigation has ended, I, I feel like we um, as citizens deserve to know how you made the decision or why you made the decision so that we can use that going forward. Um, I also think that it using consent agreements to go around the ZBA is also unfair to all the people who have been denied for similar applications. Just because they didn't have a lawyer or want to litigate doesn't mean that they, they should get the special treatment or they should get denied instead of the uh, treatment that the other people have. So thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name's Paul Jordan and I'm a practically lifelong Berkeley resident. Uh, first, I'd like to say how nice it is to be back in these hallowed chambers, seeing you folks face to face. To paraphrase Harry Chapin, I kind of had a feeling we'd all be together again, but I want to speak tonight about the Zoning Board of Appeals meeting that took place on July the 12th. If you didn't see it, I would strongly recommend watching it or at least watch the end where they addressed the recent legal settlement that the city reached which overturned a ZBA ruling against allowing a generator to be placed in a side yard. As I listened to board members speak, it became clear to me that members strongly disagreed with council's decision to settle the case and that the ZBA felt that they had their knees taken out from under them, that you guys didn't have their backs. Uh, there's also some fear that this settlement sets a precedence that if you don't like the decision, just take the city to court, they'll settle. Board members also expressed some frustration with not being able to get an explanation of council's reasoning behind the vote. I'd like to hear that too. I would like somebody to get back to me on that, please. You guys have my email address, please respond. Um, now I'll be the first to admit that I'm not a lawyer and I don't understand every fact, or I don't know every fact of the case that was presented. Maybe it wasn't winnable, but sometimes you gotta draw a line in the sand. Where is the city's line? Where is this council's line in the sand? Thank you. Thank you, Paul. All right, seeing nobody else um, that is with us, uh, Ms. Mitchell, I will come over to you. Any email correspondence that you received to be read today? No, Your Honor. All right. We will now go to the voice in the sky, Ms. Mathis. All right, well, we'll give everybody just a, just a quick second, just in case somebody's trying to get in there before we move on. No? Okay, all right, then we will close public comments tonight and we'll move on to this evening's order of business. And, and just as a uh, 
point of order, as we're going through all of the agenda items, we're going to follow the same procedure. If there are any communication, virtual, uh, in person first, and then virtual, and certainly council. Ms. Mitchell, would you please read the items on tonight's consent agenda? One, approval of the minutes. Matter of approving the minutes of the 38th regular city council meeting on Monday, June 21st, 2021, and special city council meeting on Tuesday, June 22nd, 2021. Two, warrant. Matter of approving warrant number 1364. Three, ordinance number 0621. Matter of considering the second reading and adoption of an ordinance of the Council of the City of Berkeley, Michigan to amend Division 4 of Article 8 of Chapter 82, Offenses and Miscellaneous Provisions of the City of Berkeley Code of Ordinances to prohibit the possession and use of cigarettes, tobacco, and nicotine products to persons under the age of 21, and the sale, giving, or furnishing of cigarettes, tobacco, and nicotine products, including electronic cigarettes, to persons under the age of 21, and to prescribe penalties for violations. Four, resolution number R2521, matter of adopting a resolution of the City Council of the City of Berkeley, Michigan, in opposition to legislation restricting voting rights or interfering with local clerk election procedures. Five, proclamation number P2321, matter of proclaiming July 22nd, 2021 as Master Plan Day. Is there a motion to approve this evening's consent agenda? So moved, Your Honor. Support. Motion made by Council Member Baker with support from Council Member Price. Are there any corrections or additions? Okay, seeing none. Any other comments on our consent agenda? Seeing none, Ms. Mathis, good on your end? Okay. Ms. Mitchell, then would you please call the roll on tonight's consent agenda? Gavin? Yes. Hennan? Yes. Price? Yes. Baker? Yes. Blanchard? Yes. Turbrack? Yes. We now move on to tonight's regular agenda. Ms. Mitchell, would you please read item number one? Recognitions presentations, matter of any recognitions or presentations from the consent agenda. Seeing no recognitions or presentations, we will move on to agenda item number two, please. Presentation, matter of receiving a presentation by Annika Norris of Main Street, Oakland County regarding the City of Berkeley's Main Street Accreditation Certificate and the importance Main Street has for the city. Uh, Mr. Baumgarten, do you want to give us a little bit of background here? Certainly will, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, as you know, uh, the, the city has been a good standing member of the uh, Main Street, Oakland County program for a number of years now, and uh, we've enjoyed a, a fantastic partnership with our friends at the county who have given us uh, a ton of assistance uh, both technical assistance uh, professional assistance uh, as well as monetary uh, this um, good uh, relationship we'd like to see uh, continue we've uh, received another milestone here with through the hard work of our dda board of trustees as well as our um, our, our executive director and we've achieved another accreditation then from uh, from this body. So Annika Norris, uh, who is one of our main points of contact with the county, is here to present that item to the council this evening. Thank you, Annika. I will turn it over to you. Hi, thank you. Um, so just a little bit of background on us. Uh, so Main Street, Oakland County is a part of the national uh, Main Street program. It's now pretty much referred to as Main Street America. They've kind of done a little bit of a title change there. Um, but it is a proven 40-year economic development uh, program that works very nicely with the DDA. Um, Main Street Oakland County um, is uh, a 21-year coordinating program, and we are the only countywide program in the U.S., um, which we feel benefits you because we're close by and can, can be there to serve you more. Um, this program has been helping maintain and revitalize commercial districts for over 40 years. Um, there's a network of more than 1,600 neighborhoods and communities that participate in this program. Um, and then just wanted to give you a couple stats that I thought were pretty strong. Communities participating in the program have leveraged more than $89.57 billion in new public and private investment, generated 687, 321,000 net new jobs, 150,000 net new businesses, 
and rehabilitated more than 303,836 buildings since it started uh, 40 years ago. So those are some pretty strong um, numbers that kind of help everyone understand why the Main Street approach is so strong um, and works so well. Just real quickly, there's four points to the program, economic vitality, design, organization, and preservation. And um, part of the accreditation is that you need to hit all of those within your um, Main Street program. And then kind of the, the, the one last stat I wanted to share with you is that, so Berkeley is one of 889 na nationally recognized accredited programs and you're one of 13 select level accredited programs in Oakland County and um, I greatly enjoy working with your team with the DDA and look forward to continued service with you all um, so I'm gonna leave the plaque here um, and uh, thanks well, for being well, so great thank you before before you you uh, leave that Annika I want to thank you for being with us uh, giving us yeah, that sounds like some sort of alarm here. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Uh, thank you for being with us. That was not an alarm. I haven't heard any sounds like that in a while, so I wasn't sure what was going on. I'm out of practice. Uh, I appreciate, <laughs> and I think the context you gave as well helps um, to really illustrate the value of being part of the program and, and working through the different phases and where we are. Uh, before, I want to open it up to, to council members just in case they had additional comments. Um, or maybe even some questions for you before we let you skate. All right. Councilmember Baker. Oh, thank ahead, you, Your Honor. Um, mostly just of gratitude. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working with you over the last several years here as liaison to the DDA. Uh, and to thank you and uh, the folks at the county for bringing the wisdom and insights and programs and opportunities uh, to Berkeley and, and help uh, guide us through navigating some of the waters. Uh, we've had a little bit of a transitions the last uh, couple of years here and we're embarking on one now i see so i um, very thankful um, for your continued support uh, and uh, would welcome any comments that you might offer um, on the uh, the dda's uh, master plan and the design guidelines uh, that that the uh, the board has worked so thoughtfully on over the past few years uh, any um, you know um, encouragement or words of caution that that we should uh, in, um, heed uh, as we move forward with any of those documents? That'd be that'd be most welcome. All right, very good. Obviously, yeah, not tonight, but yes. Oh, yes. Yes. In, of course. <laughs> yes. I mean, I think of I course. Think, uh, I think Berkeley has been doing an amazing job, and I know um, Jennifer here, and she's kind of it's been out on um, maternity leave a bit, but she's still been in the background. And I just have to say that, you know, the programs that we put out there, you know, DD, DDAs are typically confined to their district. And with a pandemic, we've seen DDA uh, directors and their boards stand up and, and do so much beyond the boundaries. You know, we kind of have to, we, ha we have to think a little bit further sometimes in times of crisis. And it's been great to see um, collectively the DDA board, Jennifer, helping out and to make sure those things get, like the toolkits that were presented, those didn't just go to, to DDAs, um, but they, we started with the DDAs because it's a well-organized organization that can work with the chambers and get those business lists and get them out. And uh, we just really appreciated all of that support in order to get, to make sure that our, our businesses were safe. And, and we love to see what you guys are doing. I, I feel like Berkeley's really, really kind of ahead of the game and you guys are doing really great things. and. Um, there's so many things and to be proud of here, um, which is which is great. Um, so I, it, yeah, I, I I love to look at those reports. Our staff helps look at those too, and, and we love to bring comments back to you. If there's anything we've seen elsewhere, before I came to Oakland County, I was a consultant for 14 years and kind of traveled the U.S. working in downtown specifically. So um, it, it, it's it's fun to bring back things that I've seen and then go tell other people that I've worked with about all the great things I'm seeing here in the county. Great. Thank you for the continued partnership. Thank you. Well, thank you again, Annika. And while we're talking a little bit about the DDA, I feel like this might be a good time for Mr. McGinnis to, uh, would you like to come up and give a quick introduction? I know uh, Jennifer mentioned the incredible work that Jennifer did uh, as our DDA director. And Mr. McGinnis, would you like to give a quick introduction, please, as to what your role is now? Well, good evening. Good evening to the mayor, the council, and municipal leaders. Uh, my name is Mike McGinnis, and as of a few days ago, uh, the Berkeley DDA board has uh, voted me as the interim executive director of the Berkeley DDA. And I just want to uh, celebrate uh, the really special downtown 
uh, that Berkeley, Michigan has. I'm looking forward to collaborating with you and uh, the very dedicated citizens of this great community. Uh, this was an excellent uh, segue, and uh, I look forward to building upon the excellent work of outgoing executive director uh, Finney and uh, partnering with uh, all municipal leaders. And just finally, thank all of the members of the community who came out to Ladies' Night Out on Thursday. A lot of great feedback from the retailers and small business owners. They really saw the love and support from Berkeley residents. Thank you very much. Well, thank, thank you, Mike, for, for being with us this evening. And I know I kind of put you on the spot there uh, for a, a brief introduction. Um, but we, we do look forward to, to working with you and getting to know you and hearing more about uh, your vision and, and the role that you will now be um, in, in our community. So thank you for being with us this evening. Any other comments on the presentation before we move on from council? Okay. Anybody else uh, have any comments? Jennifer, I promise I'm not putting you on the spot, but if you do want to say anything, I would certainly uh, allow that. It's completely up to you. You do not have to. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, that's fine. I just didn't want to put anybody else on the spot since I already did that to Mike. No, it's okay. I mean, um, obviously, I know, you know, the Main Street program has been great to work with Annika, so I'm glad, you know, we've continued this partnership. Um, they've been, you know, massively supportive in the pandemic and even before, so I'm glad we are able to be accredited and can work closely with that team. So thank you for all of your support for Downtown Berkeley and for the DDA and for this accreditation. Well, thank you, Jennifer, for all you did in your time as the executive director. Uh, you will certainly be, be missed, and, and don't be a stranger. I won't be. <laughs> all right, thank you. All right, we will now move on, uh, Ms. Mitchell, to item number three on tonight's agenda, please. Resolution number R2621, matter of approving the community distribution of the draft master plan. Is there a motion to approve R2621? So moved. Support. Motion made by Council Member Gavin with support from Council Member Baker. Mr. Baumgarten. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Our master plan process is coming up on an important milestone in which the City Council will consider releasing it to uh, jurisdictions outside of the city. Uh, this would include adjacent municipalities as well as uh, um, uh, oversight planning committees like SEMCOG and, and uh, the county and at the state level. Uh, you're joined this evening uh, by the primary author of the memo in your packet, uh, Ms. Erin Schluto, and I believe Ben Carlisle joins us virtually. Uh, Carlisle Wartman has been the uh, lead author on the document itself and has taken us through the plan as outlined in your packet. Erin, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, uh, I'm just going to be brief. Uh, ben will have a presentation about the timeline of where we've been, all of our engagement, everything that we've done, and certainly um, where we go from here. But uh, included in your packet is is a memo that uh, kind of summarized all of this stuff, and I thought it would be fun um, to highlight some of the high points that have occurred during the course of, of the master plan, not just what we've done uh, for the plan itself, but uh, certainly all the work that's gone into it and, and uh, by members of the steering committee, planning commission, staff, et cetera. Two babies were born to members of the master plan steering committee, one of which is here this evening. Uh, <laughs> um, there were concussions, there were broken bones and surgeries. Um, young children of staff, my youngest daughter in fact, was potty trained during the course of this. Uh, this. Uh, the members of staff uh, leash trained her cat. Yes, we're getting her help. Um, the adoption of the Parks and Rec Master Plan. Uh, Longtime public safety officer and veteran Sergeant Justin Frost retired. We purchased a new ladder truck, and I'm sure everyone got to see it, and I know a few people got to ride in it, so it was very exciting. Uh, there was the inaugural citywide Santa Parade, which was uh, very successful, and the immersive 2020 State of the City Address by the Future Academy Award winner, Mayor Dan Turbeck. <laughs> Tori Mathis, you mean. <laughs> <laughs> so those were some of the high points, and part of the consent judgment, or sorry, consent agenda this evening <laughs> was the proclamation of the master plan yeah. uh, master plan day now we did this last year uh, the date that the survey community-wide survey went out and we're uh, anticipating with your approval that this goes out to distribution to the public reviewing agencies county adjacent communities um, for our master plan day to be July 22nd 2021 which also happens to be Ben Carlisle's birthday <laughs> so with that uh, Ben are you are you on are you ready I am here. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we yep. can. Yes. Hello. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for uh, having me tonight. I apologize for not being in person, but maybe it's part of the course uh, how the last couple of years have gone with this process. 
Um, Tori, can you pull up my presentation real quickly? Let me know when you can see my screen. Good. Yep. Yep. Can everyone see it? Yes. Yep. Yes. Thank you. All right. You mind going to the next slide, Tori? Yep. First off, I want to um, I want to thank the city for um, selecting us to help you with your master plan process. Uh, we really do look at this as a process and a partnership between ourselves and the city when we do this. And it's been really, um, a, I would say a challenging process because of obviously the changes with regards to what we're dealing with now. Um, but it's also been really exciting and um, has been a very strong process. So uh, it's been 22 months to date. Um, in September of uh, 2019, uh, the council approved the contract for Carlisle Warburton to start the master plan. In October, um, as required by state law, uh, the city sent the intent to plan, and these were let letters sent to uh, adjacent communities, school district, public utility companies, Oldham County, et cetera. This is the same list that you send out the draft plan for review as well. Um, in November and December, uh, uh, the city council established and appointed residents to a uh, master plan steering committee. Um, and I'll talk a little more about the steering committee moving forward, uh, but they served diligently over the last um, 20 or 22 months. You go ahead, um, Tori. We were proceeding as we normally would with the master plan process between January and March. Uh, we were doing in-person activities, uh, including pop-ups, uh, stakeholder discussions, um, and then our world changed and everything changed. Um, the lockdown canceled all our in-person and in public engagement. And really we had to kind of uh, reassess where we were at um, and work with staff to kind of do a turning pivot point in terms of how we keep this process moving forward, but also um, allow for diligent community engagement. Because I, I know when we uh, were first hired and we interviewed, we really stressed engagement and you stress it as a important and essential element in the, the planning process. So we wanna make sure that though we were stuck doing everything online um, and virtual, that we still allowed for opportunities for anyone um, in, the, in the city, as well as uh, other stakeholders to be involved in the process and give their input. So between April and March of this year, uh, we did a numerous number of uh, community engagement activities but we were also during that time also working with the steering committee and the planning commission to, to develop the strategies and actually start writing and drafting the plan. Can you move forward, Tori? So between April and June, um, the draft text, the finalization of the, of the draft text was seen by the master plan steering committee and the planning commission. Um, we're here today. The light is, is at the end of the tunnel um, through this whole process. Um, tonight, we are asking that the planning, um, that the uh, council uh, release the plan for public review. Uh, in July, the planning commission recommended to the city council to, to distribute the plan. Um, and this would be in compliance with the Michigan State Enabling Act. Uh, next slide, Tori. Thank you. Um, I, I didn't want to um, go through the process and not focus on the engagement. Um, as I noted, we did have to really pivot and uh, really, and I'll be honest, it's, it's, something we've never had to do before. Um, we, we've done virtual engagement before, of course, but never just virtual engagement. And it was, it was new for us and new for the staff. And your, your staff was tremendous in helping us out um, in brainstorming ideas and assisting us with the engagement. Um, the engagement include um, a community survey, which um, we had, I believe, uh, close to 13 or 1400 uh, responses back to that. We had an eight part uh, webinar series and drop-in chats. Uh, we had numerous social media polls and social media updates that went out to the various uh, social media streams. Uh, we had uh, in-person, uh, not sorry, in-person, but we had uh, chats with the regional agencies that involved in planning and incorporated their ideas into our, our planning effort. Um, in addition, we did talk to adjacent communities to ensure that our plan aligns uh, with their plan efforts. Um, we held virtual focus groups and uh, multitude of stakeholder discussions. We had a uh, missing middle housing activity that many of you actually participated on, including the master plan steering committee, as well as the planning commission. We did two walking to a uh, quarter walking tours, and we also held, uh, hosted a virtual open house and breakout. Can you move on, uh, Tori? Um, I do want to note that the champions of this plan were not, were certainly not us, um, but where they were your steering committee and your, and your planning commission. They put countless hours um, into this effort and really championed and steered us uh, in the right direction. So we had at least 15 minutes of steering, 15 meetings with the steering committee and at least 
eight meetings with the Planning Commission, and I may be undercounting a little bit on these. So um, these were very highly involved meetings um, and discussions. They included both comments from the steering committee but as well, and the Planning Commission, as well as uh, community stakeholders. Um, one thing I told you when I started this, when we started this effort was there, the whole community may not agree on every single point uh, that's in your master plan. But my goal was to ensure that if a participant was active during the process, they would at least understand the reasoning behind, behind why something was in the plan. And that while we didn't agree with everything as part of the steering committee, um, and there was a lot of discussion, I do think that the steering committee can stand by this, this plan and the planning commission as well, and, and really be proud of the recommendation that came out of it. Um, uh, and I think there was a lot of consensus building in the end. I think it's one that, that is strongly supported by both those groups. I'd also be remiss if I didn't talk about your own staff. Um, the work that Aaron did, the work that Tori did, um, uh, city administrator, city manager, Mr. Baumgartner was, was tremendous as well as Dan Hill. Um, without their efforts, um, we couldn't have got this far and they really have been um, so helpful during the process and probably the most engaged staff that I've ever worked with with regards to both engagement as well as just the planning process. So they should be also applauded for their efforts as well. Um, and no, they're not paying me for this to say that. Um, Tori, can you move on? So I, I just want to really quickly highlight um, some of the highlights of the plan. Um, we spent a lot of time working with the steering committee and the planning commission on the mission, uh, vision, mission, and values. Um, I won't read these, but essentially um, the mission is, um, I'm sorry, the vision is what we're trying to strive to, and the mission is how we get to that point. And we also ensure that we encirculate these values throughout the planning document as well. Corey, can you move on? There are nine chapters um, in, the, uh, in the plan itself. Uh, the first is an executive summary. So that should give you just a highlight uh, in the major points of the plan. Uh, includes your standard background, uh, which talks about your previous plan efforts and kind of builds on the foundation of what we're doing here includes your vision, mission, and values, which really set the framework for the rest of the plan, and includes your traditional plan, uh, your traditional future land use plan, uh, and you see in all master plans. We also spent a lot of time focusing on uh, neighborhoods, corridors, and systems, and really have some very specific recommendations in those chapters. Um, lastly, there's an implementation uh, chapter, and lastly, there's the appendix, which we kind of have the background information. Can you move to the next slide, Tori? So there are really um, six, key highlights, I'd say, in the plan. Um, obviously, uh, Berkeley is a city which is super strong and built on your uh, neighborhoods. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that we, we highlight those neighborhoods, preserve those neighborhoods, um, and sustain them, but also allowing for change to benefit them moving forward. We wanted to ensure that we reconcile the zoning and future land use designations. There were um, sections of the city, specifically along Coolidge, that actually had um, separate, they had the zoning didn't match the future land use plan. And it was it made some interesting decisions of the planning commission. Um, and so we wanna make sure that we reconcile those two and put, make sure those, those are consistent moving forward. Housing came up a lot. It was a, it was a lengthy discussion. It's probably the thing we probably spent the most time discussing. Uh, and there was competing interests with regards to housing. But in the end, we wanted to ensure that if new housing is provided, it blends in with the existing uh, character of the area uh, and uses good design. Uh, fourth, um, your corridors, uh, specifically your Main Street, we talked about your 12 mile, Coolidge, um, Woodward and um, Greenfield are extremely important corridors, um, both from a business sense, but also a quality of life and community character. So we wanna make sure that we highlight those, enhance them and provide tools for um, improvements to those areas with regards to both streetscape, but also land use and other things. Um, lastly, the uh, the group spent a lot of time and actually had a member of the steering committee that was part of the environmental committee uh, and spent a lot of time talking about green infrastructure and sustainability when we incorporate those elements into the plan. And then the last thing was we wanna ensure that we focus on implementation. We don't wanna give you a plan that you can't implement because it's not worth the paper it's written on. So we um, have a whole chapter in the back um, that has a step-by-step -step, um, action plan basically on how you implement uh, the various elements of this plan. And it, it, it uh, includes what the, what the action is, but also who is in charge of doing it and the time frame to do so. So it really gives you a step-by-step -step and something that the planning commission should look at every year uh, and your staff can really use as a guidepost moving forward with, their, with implementing the plan. Lastly, so here we're here tonight. Um, 
We are asking you to um, release the draft um, to be reviewed by those list of groups I mentioned earlier. Um, if that's required by state law to move on to the next step, uh, that would then set forth the start of the 60 day review period where both those, those different agencies, but as well as public members, stakeholders, residents, et cetera, can also make comments um, on the plan. Once that 63 day period ends, we will then review the comments, um, make any changes we need to the plan based on that. Um, but most likely we'd head right into the planning commission public hearing. The planning commission is the public body that holds a public hearing with regards to the plan, uh, listen to comments um, that were submitted as part of the 60 day review period, listen to comments that, that this council may give, uh, listen to any public comments that may come out of it. Based on that public hearing, the planning commission can then decide to amend the plan based on what they hear. Um, but at some point they will make a recommendation to this council for consideration of the plan. And ultimately uh, the adoption of this plan is up to the jurisdiction and power of, of the city council. So those outline the next steps. Um, Mr. Mayor, I concluded my formal presentation, but I can answer any questions that this council may have. Well, thank you, Bob, and I appreciate you being with us. Are there any questions from the floor for Bob or Jim? Uh, but again, remember today we are making a difficult uh, decision. Do we release the draft? <laughs> do, we, do we release this out to our uh, neighboring communities and adjacent stakeholders uh, to gather feedback before uh, we go through the, the, the remainder of the process that Mr. Carlisle mm -hmm. just uh, went through? But any, any questions? Councilmember Baker. Uh, thank you, Honor. More of a comment. Uh, I will be in favor of releasing the Kraken. I mean the plan uh, tonight out. I think that's great. Uh, and I'd just like to commend my colleague, uh, Mr. Uh, Councilmember Ross, uh, for keeping council uh, advised uh, in his role as liaison to the, to the committee. Um, he has advocated um, on very greatly in, in favor of um, listening to what the members of the um, steering committee have offered. And it's been, I feel, very informed and um, came into this review process, the pre-review process, uh, very well um, comfortable with the content that was brought to us. So thank you, um, good sir. Uh, and I will be uh, in favor of supporting, uh, releasing this tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Price. Did I see a hand up? No, but I'm always oh, okay. happy to Never make mind a that. comment. I, 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 <laughs> maybe I looked over there. I'm still getting used to what it's like when I have to see people, actually. All right, so I got people Fine. on this side. I, I will make a okay. quick comment. Okay. Um, I, of course, wanted to thank all of the citizen resident volunteers who participated on the Master Plan Steering Committee um, and our consultants for facilitating this. I was able to attend a few of the virtual um, town hall uh, focus groups experiences and your ability to shut down the zoom bombers was particularly impressive <laughs> uh, learned a lot from watching that and also the way that you uh, were able to make sure that all of the residents felt heard like you said building consensus um, no one felt shut, shut out their their points of views were heard and recognized and I feel like you were able to get a lot of participation that was constructive and helpful so thank you for facilitating that process. Thank you. Council Member Henn. Yeah, um, I wanted to echo a lot of the similar statements. I'm going to be voting to approve distribution of the draft. Um, I think it's ready. There are uh, two things in particular that I have some concerns about. They're, they're, I don't think they're necessary to discuss today. Uh, that's for in other parts of the process. But otherwise, I've just been very pleased with the process, the public input. Uh, the draft we got and I also wanted to especially commend our staff and the consultants dealing with the unique challenges COVID presented and when we're preparing such an important document. Thank you. Councilmember Gavin. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. And uh, yeah, I echo a lot of the comments. I certainly want to thank everyone who put a ton of time into this um, master plan process, notably Aaron, uh, Matt, Tori, Ben, Megan, uh, the whole committee, but really all residents that did provide feedback and thoughts on it. Uh, certainly was a difficult journey um, and uh, the ability to adapt on the fly was something that was uh, mightily impressive uh, and so to create such a exciting and great document uh, is really a testament to everyone involved so I look forward to the drafting process eventually coming to a conclusion and the implementation process to begin so thank you well thank you Councilmember Gavin and I too want to echo uh, those thoughts when we embarked on this process it certainly did not end up the way that we thought it was going to um, and, and it was incredible the way that we were still able to pivot. I know initially a lot of folks were concerned that we were not going to be able to engage 
with the residents as much as we, we were able to. Um, I think we did an incredible job. Not, not, I shouldn't say me. Everybody else who was a part of this did an incredible <laughs> job. Staff, um, the consultants, facilitators, making sure that everybody did have an opportunity. The master plan steering committee, we looked at the number of meetings that they you know, volunteered their time and efforts to our community. Uh, certainly the planning commission and I too look forward to the next steps in, uh, in this process and, and bringing this uh, plan to life in our community. Council Member Blanchard. I'll just make, put, throw in my two cents. Also, I think it's an excellent document. I'm really happy the way it turned out, uh, a lot of effort put in it. Uh, I've got two minor comments I'm going to submit to Aaron, and they're just tweaks in, in the language a little bit, to, but uh, the concept is great. I like it, so I'll be approving. I'd like to approve that also. Thank you. Any comments um, on releasing the draft with those of you that are with us this evening? Okay, thank you. Ms. Mathis, any uh, virtual comments? Only seeing John at this time, sorry. All right. Uh, Ms. Mitchell, I assume if you had any emails, you would have gotten those out, or do you have emails specifically on any agenda? I do, items? Okay. I do not. Okay, perfect. Well, uh, again, I appreciate uh, the presentation. Thank you for being with us this evening, Mr. Carlisle. Thank you, Aaron, as you mentioned, all the things that have happened when we embarked on this process, uh, some certainly better than others, but this is something that, that I know the city is proud of, um, and we look forward to, to moving with that. So, Ms. Mitchell, would you please call the roll on R2621? Gavin? Yes. Hennan? Yes. Price? Yes. Baker? Yes. Blanchard? Yes. Turbrack. Yes. Ms. Mitchell, would you please read item number four on tonight's agenda? Motion number M4221, matter of authorizing the purchase and install of new play equipment at Community Park at a cost not to exceed $155,512 for Mid-States Recreation 1279 Hazleton Etna Road, Southwest Patascala, Ohio 43062. Funds for this expenditure will come from account 615-950-974-000. Is there a motion to approve M4221? So motion moved. to approve. Mm -hmm. Motion made by Council Member Hennon with support from Council Member Blanchard. Oh, I, sure. I thought, Mr. Stair, I thought you wanted to get in and. No, and no, no. Like, uh, <laughs> I didn't think you were able to do that. I know it's been a while, but no. Okay. All right. Uh, Mr. Baumgarten. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this is another example of a plan coming together, uh, much like we just discussed. Uh, as cited in the five-year recreation master plan, our community park was one of, the one, uh, one of our local parks that was slated to get brand new equipment. Uh, over the course of the budget process, we talked at length about the improvements that could be made at, at this area. And so uh, I'm very happy to see uh, this come before council this evening. Uh, virtually, uh, our Parks and Recreation Director, Teresa McCarlton, joins us uh, to talk a little bit about the benefits and the uniqueness of the, uh, the play equipment that uh, she has been able to scout and, uh, and, and investigate and, and bring before you this evening. So uh, as noted in her memo, the, uh, she did go through a uh, purchasing consortium for this budgeted item. So this is one of the many ways and we ensure that we're getting the best value for the equipment that we purchase. All right, Ms. McCarlton, are you with us? Hello, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can, yes. Okay. All right, so um, thank you for having me this evening. Uh, I appreciate you letting me attend uh, virtually. As the memo lays out, this is actually the first time that we have done play equipment in this manner it, with the purchasing consortium. A uh, number of cities do do this. Um, the benefit that it gives you is that it allows you to work directly with the manufacturer, um, with the, the play equipment representative to get exactly what you want as opposed to going out to bid and getting sort of their idea for it. So uh, we worked very collaboratively, collaboratively on this with Mid-States Recreation, which we have worked with in the past. Um, one of the things that's really important to us as we're updating a lot of our play equipment is to um, a couple different things. One, have different types of play. And then two, use different um, companies so that your play equipment doesn't all feel and look, have a similar um, look to it. So we worked really closely with Mid-States. Uh, Community Park is unique in that it's a small space. Um, and in order to get more than what we have, we would have had to cut down beautiful mature trees, which we are not willing to do um, and not wanting to do. So what we came up with was the design that you have in your packet 
um, there's a pretty standard design that has um, ramp access from one of the walkways. Um, it's for two to five year olds and it has what's called a sway. It's sort of like a glider, um, very cool. Little kids like it, older kids like it. Um, seniors like it, it kind of feels like you're on a rocking boat. Um, we do not have any in our city parks. I know some of the school parks have something similar. Um, there's also some different sensory item, sensory panels on that ramp equipment as well as a larger slide. The other system is for five to 12 year olds and it's called Infinite. It's a really cool rope netting system that allows you to kind of go to different degrees of netting smaller, uh, lower to the ground for the smaller kids and higher for some of the older uh, kids. And then it has these really cool um, sort of like treehouse structures because the way that that park is laid out, you almost feel like you're in a treehouse with all of the shade and with all of the trees. So this system called Infinite we think is really different, really unique. In fact, um, we will be one of the two first, um, when we decided to go with this system, we were the only one in Michigan that would be having it. I've since found out another city is um, getting it, but they're not too close to us. Um, so again, looking for unique ways to play, different ways to play, rope and netting is very popular right now. Um, and, but then also having the traditional structure so it's not all rope. Um, I think we've got a really good price um, with working through the consortium. You can see the discount in terms of the price. The one thing that we were hoping to be able to have is to have either a rubber port and surfacing or at this um, particular park, we wanted to do artificial turf um, to make it more fully accessible. Um, unfortunately, with cost, that wasn't able, that wasn't possible right now. So it will be what's um, known as engineered wood fiber, uh, more commonly known as mulch um, that we have in some of our other playgrounds. Um, I did have a council member reach out and ask at some point if we wanted to change that out and we were able to um, get turf or rubber port and surfacing. We can do that without disturbing the equipment. So I'm really excited for this. Um, Community Park has needed this for a while. Uh, if you recall, this was budgeted um, in the last fiscal year due to the pandemic, we did push it back. Um, and now we're excited to be moving forward with this. I'm bringing this to you now um, in July. We are, they, most manufacturers are on about a three month lag time. So this will be installed roughly sometime in early to mid October. Happy to answer any questions that you may have. Um, and as the city manager said, um, this is something that we've talked about um, for the last several five year plans. Community park has been a great focus. One of the things that our residents did say that they wanted to see at this park that we unfortunately were not able to bring to them was some sort of a swing. Um, we did have one in an early design, but it would have caused trees to have to um, be removed. And we did not think that that was worth that cost. Thank you, Mr. Carlton, um, for being with us this evening and for walking us through uh, the plans for the park. Questions or comments for Ms. McCarlton? Councilmember Blanchard. Thank you, Your Honor. I just have a, a comment. I, as I look through the document, it looks very comprehensive, but I want everybody to know that the, the bottom line on this is that we saved $27,769.50 by using this sourcing method. So uh, I'd like to congratulate uh, Teresa and her staff for seeking this out and saving the city a great deal of money on this new playground equipment. So thanks for the job that you do for us. Excellent. Thank you. Additional questions? Councilmember Price? Yes, thank you so much, Director McCarlton, for being here and presenting this uh, to us tonight. As you know, um, being so close to the middle school, the community center in this, this particular park, uh, tends to get a lot of middle school students coming to it to congregate, to hang out, to use the equipment. And I was wondering, how are the needs or interests of those middle school students considered when you were selecting this equipment? Thank you for asking that question. Um, we really did consider it. One of the things that we considered is during the day, we see a lot of really young kids at the park, um, which is where the ramp and the glider and the small slide come in. Again, they can use the smaller stuff. What's really cool about the Infinite is um, older kids can kind of hang from it, but it also has these sort of like netted, almost like hammock um, parts of it that people just sort of lounge. Um, and what I find with a lot of the middle schoolers, because we, we do see them there every day, um, is that they kind of just want to hang and lounge. And these nets almost allow you, it's sort of almost like a hammock where they can hang out and then they can climb on them too. They can have their little like treehouse effect and sit in there if they want privacy. But there's also the aeroglider, which is sort of like a hang station as well. 
So we did think about, okay, what, how do we use it during the day? And then how does it sort of shift in the afternoon when the middle schoolers are there when they get out? And I think the infinite system um, really works well for that. I think you'll see them lounging, you'll see them hanging out, you'll see them climbing from the different layers. Um, and I, I really, I'm, I'm pretty excited about it, if you can't tell, because it is very different. Uh, if anyone's interested, you can email me and I can send you uh, this great video of how the system works. You have photos, but if you see it in real time in a video, um, you could sort of see how these middle schoolers will be able to interact with the equipment and it'll be, um, the rope is really strong, so it's, it's totally workable for them and, and can hold up to, to their, um, their age. And I think it will be something that is really different that they'll think is pretty cool. Fantastic. And thank you for considering having all the different kinds of play equipment in our different parks in the whole area at finding um, a play structure that is affordable for us and unique in the area. I think that's fantastic that you're thinking about those things and finding ways to serve all of our youngest residents. So thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Baker. Uh, thank you, uh, Your Honor, and uh, to, uh, Teresa, thank you again to you and your team and the advisory board and all of the work that's gone into this proposal. Uh, I did find this to be very exciting as well and uh, eager to see the diversity of equipment and uh, amenities, uh, as has been mentioned. Um, if you could just briefly touch on the seasonality of the netting, uh, given that it's, uh, you know, we do have snow and ice and those kinds of things, uh, if this uh, netting is meant to be a four-season um, uh, installation, meaning it's going to be there, or if there is um, a window where it might be removed for safety or for maintenance purposes, just so folks can kind of get an understanding to, to make sure they get in there and lounge around while they still can, so to speak. Any, uh, any comments that you may have around the, uh, the seasonality of, of the netting um, that's part of the design here? Sure. No, that's a great question. It's really strong rope. It holds up for all four seasons. It's been um, the the initial, uh, the first time Infinite was used at, is at a great park in Toledo. Um, it's been there for a couple of years now and it's held out. Um, so it is something that can be used. It, it, it's not something you take down. It's not, um, it's much stronger than, uh, you know, it's, it's more tough rope. So uh, ice, snow, um, it will not be affected. You can play on it um, all four seasons. Um, and again, we've seen that with the, the several years that it's already been in place uh, in this park in Toledo. I've been to that park. It's really, uh, it's a great park. It's called Swan Creek. Um, and um, yeah, so they, they were the first to use this infinite system. Excellent. Thank you so much. And, and kudos again to the team. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other comments? I do have, uh, I did speak to Mayor Pro Tem Dean um, earlier today, and she also wanted to express her gratitude, um, Teresa, to you and the team for the thoughtfulness that you have, have described that went into um, this equipment, the, the two different types of equipment that we have here. Uh, just being very cognizant of not only the budget constraints and what makes sense there, but also what we currently have in the city, um, what would make this potentially different and, and what seems to be uh, something that kids will gravitate towards um, as we start to identify each of the different parks in our city that have some sort of different unique offerings. When I first looked at it, I thought these were like four trampolines and I thought that was a <laughs> bad idea. So I'm glad uh, upon further review that they are just ropes. I thought we would have kids going off left and right. Uh, but I do, uh, I, I do think it is a very unique look and I think it's gonna be great to have another offering uh, for our community. So cool. Mayor, Pro Tem, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Dean thanks you and I also thank you. Comments from folks that are with us today about the new proposed equipment at Community. Okay, Ms. Mathis, do we have any virtual comments? We do not. We do not, okay. Well, with that then, Ms. Mitchell, would you please call the roll on M4221? Hennon? Yes. Price? Yes. Baker? Yes. Blanchard? Yes. Gavin? Yes. Turbrack? Yes. Ms. Mitchell, would you please read item number five on tonight's agenda? Presentation, matter of receiving a presentation on the 2020 Planning Commission Annual Report. Uh, Mr. Baumgarten, do you have any intro or do we want to hand it right to our director? Uh, Mr. Mayor, you're in good hands with the Community Development Director. Director Schluto, I will hand it over to you. Hello, good evening, everyone. 
Um, so this item comes to you from the Planning Commission. It's a uh, requirement uh, per the Michigan Planning Enabling Act. Uh, the Planning Commission is required to prepare an annual report uh, documenting its operations and status of all planning activities. Um, it states in part, a Planning Commission shall make an annual written report to the legislative body concerning its operations and the status of planning activities, including recommendations regarding action by the legislative body related to planning and development. So you've seen this before, you've seen it every year. Um, this year is a little bit different. So I, uh, I played with the, the format, I added some more information as opposed to uh, just strictly planning commission, but also included um, some, some other things as well, and I'll kind of go through these, these briefly. So this annual report comes to you every year in July. Um, it's the annual report uh, encompassing the fiscal year. So this will include everything from July 2020 to June 30th, 2021. Um, this was presented at the Planning Commission at the June meeting uh, to the Planning Commission. They, they reviewed it, they recommend it, they, they sent it on to you as a, as a wholly encompassing uh, record of their activities. So we have the appointment dates of all the commissioners that we've had here. As you can see, some are uh, relatively new. And then we have a couple of seasoned veterans who've been with us for many, many years. So they've been a, a really wonderful um, um, foundation to, to kind of stand upon when we've gone through our master plan and everything that we're, we're going through. So the Planning Commission held 12 regular meetings and six work sessions during the fiscal year. We reviewed three site plans, one special land use which came to, to this body, as well as seven zoning text amendments which also came to this body. So um, you'll see the site plan projects kind of summarize what they were looking for, the meeting date upon which they were approved, um, special land use as well, and uh, this, the, the zoning text amendments that came before you. Now you'll see um, this again and there'll be much more, many more next year after we go through the master plan and, and whatnot. So I do provide a summary on page four uh, of the, the master plan. So this is something that's taken up a lot of staff's time as well as the planning commission, the master plan steering committee. Um, we just went through um, kind of the highlights and the community engagement and the timeline uh, with uh, Ben Carlisle, so I won't go through all of that, but um, it's, a really, uh, it's been a really um, exhaustive, uh, thorough, comprehensive process to make sure that we um, try to reach as many as many people in the community as possible and get as many um, thoughts and feelings and feedback from them as possible on page next page we kind of go through the next steps of the process so uh, once the master plan has been adopted by this body um, then the work really comes into play that's when we really go through our zoning ordinance we go through a technical review we see what lines up what doesn't and then we make um, a lot of zoning ordinance amendments so this will be a lengthy process as the zoning uh, ordinance has not received or has not had a comprehensive review in many, many years, some sections since 19, 1981. So things are different. Things need to be updated. Things need to be uh, brought into this, this century. So um, that's where a lot of our time is going to be focused um, in, in, in the coming months, coming years. And then the, the new part that I've added this year is the community development department. So I wanted to highlight, especially since we've just come from COVID where there was a massive shutdown of all construction activities, what we've been doing this past year and how that kind of compares to, to the other years. Now, you do receive a monthly report that outlines all of this, but uh, you know, just here for a comprehensive review and this is uh, uh, distributed to, to the public so they can, can really see what, what's been going on. Um, we slowed down for a couple of months uh, when construction halted, but then as soon as it kicked up back up again, we've been in high gear. Um, the building department has been just absolutely crazy with permits and reviews and inspections. Now planning projects are really starting to come into play with site plans and, and facade improvements, so we're, we're, we're very, very busy. I also wanted to highlight the code enforcement section. Um, this is an area that doesn't get a whole lot of, of highlight or a whole lot of uh, special attention. Um, in fiscal year 2020, 772 enforcements were logged into BSNA and 664 have been closed. Uh, this would equate to an 86% success rate. So we're very proud of everything that our code enforcement officer has been, has been doing over this past year. And I've included a breakdown of some of the more um, uh, popular, I guess you would call it, uh, the, the grievances or the enforcements that get a lot of attention trash, grass and weeds, no permits, snow and ice, property maintenance, debris branches, those are just the ones that are more popular. Um, so just kind of give you an idea as to what the repeat offenders are in, in our community. Additionally, I wanted to highlight some of the achievements and accomplishments that have gone on, not only that the Planning Commission has been a part of, but also the department as well. 
So we transitioned to a work from home space. I mean, I know the entire city did that, but uh, coming from a, a building department where we really focus on the face-to-face -face at the counter interaction, this was a really, um, really interesting transition for all of us to try to do from home. So uh, the staff worked beautifully to try to get everything uh, worked out together, especially when most of our um, questions, answers, things like that come from face-to-face. -face. And a lot of the contractors, you know, um, really struggled trying to get us all the information we needed, scanned over and whatnot. And so the staff has been incredible with that. Um, as you know, we've done the had resolutions passed for temporary outdoor dining sales. This also include the temporary closure at Griffith and 12 Mile. These been, have been ex success, exceptionally successful in our community. Um, this is something that will be brought before you to discuss again at a later date. Uh, the extensions of the board approvals uh, with all the the ceasing and uh, ending of construction for quite some time we ran the risk of some of our site plans special land use zoning board of appeals uh, approvals um, being null and void because a year would have passed before they were able to pull their permits and get things going so uh, luckily we were able to secure an extension of approval until the end of this year so that way they had some extra time to get their pro uh, projects in place the master plan community engagement again very proud of this you know with everything shut down and transferring to a vir completely virtual format we really engaged the, the public in a way that i haven't done in other communities and certainly ben and megan uh, haven't done before in their career so uh, we really uh, broached new ground here and we're really proud of the amount of work that we did um, when we first started we were thinking of possibly putting the plan on pause thinking maybe it would only go one or two months but uh, I'm glad we didn't because then we would be sitting here going okay master plan now we start <laughs> and instead now we have a document that's ready to go out for distribution so I'm really proud with the, the fact that we were able to to roll and adapt and keep moving forward uh, in addition to that uh, city staff had some guest speaking engagements we were asked to speak about our experiences uh, related to community engagement uh, for COVID and doing the master plan process so I'm really proud of the fact that we uh, we were asked to attend and speak about our experiences at those at those functions. We've updated our permit planning and permit application packets. This is uh, this is largely just an administrative thing, but it has really streamlined the process and made things easier for for applicants to understand what the process is and what they need to do and what documents they need to provide to us. So it's not only saved us time, but it's made things easier and more transparent for for people who are uh, proposing projects. We've updated our fee schedule. As you know, this came before you last month, so I don't need to bore you with that one. Um, we've updated our business license application and created a how to open a business brochure and a land use matrix. This is really in response to a lot of questions and, and things that have happened with how to open a business in Berkeley. So we created a seven step process. It's all up on our website. Uh, in addition to that, we created a land use matrix in order to help future business owners know exactly where their business could go. They have an idea for a restaurant. Well, can it go at the corner of Cumberland and Oakshire? No, it cannot. Um, <laughs> can it go on Woodward and Eaton? Yes, it can. So, you know, those types of things, we really wanted to make sure we could um, help them and so that way we can focus on the bigger projects and they don't have to feel like they're waiting on us to do, to do everything. They can really take, take things into their own hands a little bit more. And we've updated the Planning Commission, Zoning Board of Appeals, Rules of Procedure, and this is, again, just a uh, more administrative thing, but it really codifies um, the requirements of the attendance policy and the continued education and the initial training uh, ordinance that this body passed last year. So it really brings those ordinance requirements up to the forefront, and people know exactly what they're doing, exactly what they're responsible for, before they even apply to, to serve on those boards. And that way, nothing's, nothing's surprising, and they know exactly what they need to do. Additionally, in this document, I included the 2021 work plan. So there are five, um, five items here that we are going to be focusing on in the next year and, and, and on. We're not going to get all of these things done this year. Um, it's just not going to happen. But it really puts us into a place where we can start checking some boxes. So adopt the master plan. We're releasing it for distribution to the public, so we're on our way for that. Redevelopment ready community certification. A big component of that is the master plan and the zoning ordinance updates. So we are on our way to doing that. We're still doing some of uh, the administration, administrative stuff uh, behind the scenes, the um, business license um, updates and um, making things more transparent on our website. Those are big boxes that we've checked there already. It doesn't seem like it, but we are moving, moving closer to that direction. And as soon as the master plan is done and the zoning ordinance is ready, then we'll We've got a couple more small things to do and we're, we're, we're ready to go. So new ordinance technical review, I've already mentioned that. 
Uh, the sign ordinance rewrite. Now, this is something that uh, John Stern and I have talked about uh, several times, and this is something that we'll be working on uh, collaboratively over the next year. Uh, the DDA guidelines and overlay districts. Uh, I know this is something that uh, that the, the, the city council, planning commission, we've all been very excited and interested over the past year. So this is something we're really working forward towards. I uh, have a draft uh, that's been sent out to a, a few people. We have some tweaks, and we're, we've got this kind of small committee that we're kind of working on before it goes to the DDA, before it goes to planning commission. So that's that's moving right along and in line as well. Uh, it's been wonderful working with the community over the past year, City Council, Planning Commission, Master Plan Steering Committees, Zoning Board of Appeals, DDA. Uh, look forward to the next year and being able to report on all of our, our new activities. So <coughs> be happy to answer any questions that you have. Any questions for our director on the report? Councilmember Hennon? Yeah, uh, first I think this is great packet, great information, great presentation. Um, on the Zordnan zoning ordinance updates that we're considering doing, what's the order of time of how long we think that might take, if we even have an idea? Are we talking a year, years? You know, what's the, what's it look like? Well, I guess it depends on how we do it. So we can do things in, in small sections, taking a sign, the sign ordinance, taking the parking ordinance, and doing things in, in one chapter or, or one article at a time. Um, or we can do it as a full comprehensive document. Um, we're going to be having a, we have budgeted for a third party to, to help us in that venture, um, but it, it can take some time. So it, a sign ordinance can take several months. Uh, to do it all at once could, could take about a year. So right. it's just a And I see oh. pros and cons of both approaches, Agreed. and I don't, I don't know which I prefer. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Additional comments or questions, Councilmember Baker. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I'd love to. I'd like to echo uh, comments, and, and this is a tremendous document. It's absolutely brilliant uh, the way it's written. It's structured. It captures so much of what's happened, uh, especially given the, the 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 circumstances and challenges that that staff and our volunteers and our residents and our contractors and and support uh, machinery has uh, has um, sought to overcome here in the past. 15 months or so. This is uh, it's a great document. I love the looking forward portion of it as well to say not only here's where we've been, but here's where we're headed. And uh, so I want to commend you and the staff for uh, for this great document. Uh, and um, I guess equally importantly, um, all of the great work that this document represents, right? And it is a fantastic uh, artifact. But it's the residue of, of tremendous work and, and great thinking and, and a lot of uh, positive energy uh, from all of the groups that you mentioned, all those acronyms, uh, which has rolled off the tongue so easily for you. So uh, so um, very grateful for this, and, and thank you. Congratulations, and here's to another great year. Thank you. All right. Seeing no additional um, comments, questions. Again, thank you, Aaron, for the uh, depth of this report and, and some of the tweaks that you've made. I think it's very important not only to see those numbers and, and knowing that 2020 and early 2021 are not necessarily representative of a normal year, but seeing what our trends are and also the, some of the bigger things that we're looking to, to attack. And we have made tremendous progress, as you mentioned, in a number of places, but we're always going to strive to be better. As you mentioned, there's some, some target areas in 2021 that we're going to focus on for the future, and I'm very excited uh, to continue in, in council partnering uh, with, with you and the entire planning side of things as we continue to move forward. So thank you, Aaron. Now, I don't have to vote on that. I was getting ready to call the vote, but that was just a presentation. <laughs> so Ms. Mitchell, I guess I'll ask you instead to read item number six, please. Motion number M4321, matter of considering a bid from WCI Contractors, Inc., 20210 Connor Street, Detroit, Michigan, 48234, for $165,094,000 for the BHS Plaza project. Costs are to be shared evenly with the Berkeley Downtown Development Authority and Berkeley School District. Is there a motion to approve M4321? So moved, Your Honor. Support. Moved by Councilmember Baker, a support from Councilmember Hennon. Mr. Baumgarten. Hi, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this item comes before you as uh, a, a show of the hard work that was put in by, uh, in, in large part, by Jennifer Finney, our, our uh, DDA De Executive Director Emeritus. Uh, uh, after the city entered into a intergovernmental agreement back in August of last year uh, with the DDA as well as the school district, uh, she went to work on, make, on putting out a set of bid specs to be uh, a bid on for 
the development of this plaza project, which would be a fantastic gathering space and, and part of the, the city's aligned goals uh, with the DDAs as well as the school districts on creating a public hub space in the downtown area. Um, so we got uh, bids back in September. They, uh, they, they came back higher than the initial estimate that we had from uh, the engineers that helped us put together the specs for it. Um, so we were set with sort of a, a what do we do next uh, situation. It was September at that point. It was uh, in the midst of COVID. It was difficult to get uh, bids for uh, something in the winter. And so after putting our heads together and again, having a, a Jennifer sort of lead the charge on this, um, as we circle back around to this, the collective entities involved uh, committed to uh, putting forth more resources in their next fiscal year budget, which uh, for each of us began uh, 1st of July of this year. And so now we come before you with, uh, we went back to those vendors. They did have a modest increase, uh, actually was lower than was expected by the three entities. It was uh, somewhere between five to 7%, depending on the itemized um, section in there. And uh, with each body committing to uh, putting forth uh, a total of about $60,000 a piece, uh, we actually are, are very happy with the price that we have here. Uh, I want to transition into thanking the school district who has committed now for not only with providing the space itself, uh, but they've also committed some of their staff members to oversight of the construction, which uh, as we know from, from some from previous conversations, uh, the city typically has an outside vendor handle uh, the construction process. It in and of itself can be a little bit costly to do. It certainly adds to the construction of it alone. So the city, or so the school district is uh, really helping making this pr uh, project as affordable as possible. Uh, we're the third entity of the three partners to, uh, to approve this. The school board was able to uh, approve this on July 12th. The DDA board was able to approve this on July 14th. Uh, both of them approved contingent to the, the third leg of the stool on the city also approving it. So uh, with all that being said, the uh, uh, staff and the DDA and the school board uh, all jointly recommend approval of this item. Thank you, uh, Mr. Baumgarten, for the explanation of uh, how we got to where we are. I know many of us certainly remember discussing this, as you mentioned before, had to make some changes and proud that we're able to be back with us again. and continuing to work with, with the group, as you mentioned. Questions or comments uh, for Mr. Baumgarten? Councilmember Hennan? Yes, um, after construction is complete, who's responsible for the day-to-day -day maintenance and the longer-term maintenance issues? Th those costs would likewise be shared by the three entities. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Blanchard? Thank you, Your Honor. I know one time there was a question about whether the cost of this included uh, benches and things, uh, and I don't see the, see them in this quote. Uh, is this, does this cover the vast majority of stuff there? I'm it would cover the construction of the plaza space itself, uh, street furniture, art displays, and some of the other things will be coming to, uh, before the three bodies later. Uh, we're hoping to do some additional fundraising through the, uh, the, downtown, the downtown partnership nonprofit in order to raise funds for those. Okay. Thank you. Again, this is, this is a great project that we are able to, to partner with not only our DDA, but also uh, the school district who, who we've mentioned a, a few times over the course of our virtual meetings and the work that we've been able to do and, and certainly the rapport that we've built with, with the school district. Certainly have a tremendous rapport with the DDA. Uh, this was the first opportunity that I had to actually uh, speak with uh, Superintendent Francis. Oh, I, gotta, I gotta remember that, <laughs> Superintendent Francis. Uh, we, we had a great conversation. We, we talked a little bit about our shared vision in, in both um, expressed the desire to want to continue working together and thinking that this project was certainly a great start and obviously uh, with the support of our DDA as well, who was my next phone call right after I got off the phone with, uh, with Mr. Francis. So uh, very excited to be able to, to make this happen, to continue working together uh, to have a better Berkeley for all of us and all of those entities. Ms. Mitchell, oh, hold on, no, I gotta wait. All right, anybody here like to comment before I, before I call for a roll here? Sorry, I got a little ahead of myself. Ms. Mathis, any virtual comments? No, sir. Okay. Ms. Mitchell, you are now allowed to please call <laughs> the roll on M4321. Price? Yes. Baker? Yes. Blanchard? Yes. Gavin? Yes. Hennan? Yes. Turbrack? Yes.
We have now reached the communications portion. And Ms. Mitchell, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to do this, but can I just start with Councilmember Blanchard so I can make my way around? Absolutely. <laughs> Perfect. Councilmember Blanchard, you are up. Thank you, Your Honor. First thing I want to, want to apologize for that interruption of my cell phone. That was the Oakland County Sheriff paging me out for a uh -oh. missing individual in Rochester. An elderly individual, I see that because he's older than I am. <laughs> not by much, but he's older than I am. Uh, so they're calling out the incident management team and the communication support team. So I'll probably be going there after this meeting to see what, what's going on up there. Uh, what I really wanted to cover was that the next event the chamber has is the Street Art Fest, which will be coming up August 7th. Uh, artists will begin drawing at 8 a.m. but it's open to the public from 11 to 5. You can watch art be created and create art yourself because you can register to draw there on Coolidge between Beverly and Catalpa. Enjoy watching chalk artists create colorful street art, shop at the Shop for Good Village from a curated collection of handmade products, product makers and sellers with primary focus on doing good and on, local, on a local and global scale. Create your own street art with your family. Socially distant squares are available, so you can register through the chamber, create a square, go down there and put chalk all over it, and maybe win a prize. So that's, uh, that is August 7th. And the back to the quotes on uh, from emergency management we cannot stop natural disasters we can arm ourselves with knowledge so many lives would have to be lost if there was enough disaster preparedness petra nemkova said that so thank you Excellent. thank you council member price yes thank you mayor turbrack well, I can hardly believe that we're able to sit here in person after so many months meeting virtually. Well, I certainly don't feel grateful for the pandemic in general. I am grateful for a few specific things that have indirectly resulted from it. I'm grateful that we no longer take for granted our ability to connect and collaborate in person. COVID revealed just how much we rely on each other to stay sane and safe and I appreciate the in-person connections now more than ever. The pandemic also required us to be more flexible than ever. We could no longer do things a certain way simply because we had never tried a different approach. Our city leadership and staff were forced to pivot, adapt, and then try something new as recommendations evolved. This particular hybrid meeting format, which enables the public to participate from home, is one of so many examples of creative solutions that has also made city business more accessible and inclusive than ever. So kudos to all who made this happen. And as for my boards and commissions, uh, the Citizens Engagement Advisory Committee met this past Wednesday. You can look for even more information and resources from them on the Berkeley Community Resources Facebook group. The Beautification Advisory Committee will meet again on Wednesday, July 28th to discuss their plans for the fall. And the Library Board will meet again on Wednesday, August 11th. The Library will also be hosting a drawing workshop on Thursday, July 22nd at 6.30 p.m. It is going to be facilitated by um, a group called Camp Pencil Point. My kids have attended their virtual sessions before. They're lots of fun. No registration required. It's Facebook Live, and adults are welcome to join, too. That's all from me. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Baker. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. A couple of quick updates as well. Uh, as mentioned earlier, the Downtown Development Authority has been busy. DDA met again last week's Wednesday. Uh, among many of the exciting topics they had on the agenda, in addition to the, the plaza that was just discussed, uh, was the appointment of Mr. Mike McGinnis uh, as our new uh, interim DDA director, and he's here again with us tonight. I want to thank him for his time and the, and the creative energy that he will bring to our community. Uh, and he's got uh, uh, big uh, shoes to fill and shoulders to stand on here with, uh, with Jennifer and the tremendous work that that she and her team did, uh, most recently including the, uh, as mentioned, the, uh, the ladies' night out last Thursday. Uh, kudos again to the volunteers for making all that happen, the businesses for embracing it, and the residents uh, for coming out and enjoying it. So, uh, so thank you to, to them all. Um, historical committee, it was 30 years ago uh, that the committee was formed here in uh, Berkeley and the museum was open, so happy anniversary to our historical committee uh, celebrating a milestone of their own. They're planning a little celebration event 
uh, for the committee uh, in, the, in the weeks ahead here, which is really cool. Uh, it was five years ago uh, today that uh, Berkeley and uh, uh, the state of Michigan became the first in the nation uh, to formally recognize Lyomire Sacoma Awareness Day on July 15th, uh, which just recently passed. Uh, that um, recognition and um, awareness has long been sought by the LMS community, and so uh, it was uh, great to have been a, a part of, of making that small little bit of history that means uh, a whole lot to, uh, to many among us here, which was super cool. Uh, and uh, the folks from the museum would also like to thank everyone that made it out for the street sign sale. You may uh, have heard that we had our second round of uh, the street signs um, for sale. Uh, we want to thank all the residents that came out for those. Uh, more than $1,000 um, have been added to the coffers to continue um, improvements to the museum and the acquisition of additional uh, materials. Uh, and the shout out there goes to DPW for making those signs available in the first place. Uh, it was a tremendous partnership across a couple of great different teams there. Uh, the Technology Committee meets again uh, in August. It'll be a little while for them yet. Uh, and they did offer, again, to remind us all that although the city's website remains insecure after these last couple of months, uh, please know that any financial transactions uh, that you choose to conduct um, are held through a third party which does have uh, the security necessary. Uh, to ensure that everything is on the up and up. So, so that's good news for all of us. Uh, and finally, it was uh, Bing Crosby and the Andrews sisters who once sang, you've got to accentuate the positive, eliminate the negative, <laughs> latch on to the affirmative, and uh, don't mess with Mr. In-Between. Now, I might be dating myself by quoting that song. Um, but as you know, I'm, a, I'm generally a positive, uh, upbeat kind of person and, uh, and find lots of great things uh, in life here, including that song, which is kind of a motto of mine, I suppose. Uh, but being aware of the world around us is important, too. Uh, and sadly, not everybody uh, has that same, uh, that same kind of philosophy or embraces uh, the notion of honesty, equality, and compassion uh, for, uh, for others. Uh, or at least they don't embrace it in the same way that... Uh, is intended by tunes like that. In our consent agenda this evening, uh, we uh, unanimously passed a resolution in opposition to voter suppression bills here in Michigan and across the country. Uh, as of mid-June, 17 states in this great nation had passed 28 laws, meaning it's official, to make it harder for constituents to vote in 2021 and going forward. Uh, Michigan state legislators have introduced 39 bills that would restrict citizens' voting rights, harm election administration, and demonstrate a, a, a lack of knowledge of existing uh, election procedures and laws. Uh, this has been driven by an extremely vocal few who propagate fear, resentment, and flat-out lies about the exceptionally secure 2020 election. We also see similar actions and behaviors from actively spreading disinformation and easily disproved lies about the COVID uh, vaccine, which continue to this day. Recently, the US Surgeon General recently warned that misinformation is an urgent threat to public health, and the failure to curb misinformation puts American lives at risk. 48 states, everyone except for Maine and South Dakota, are now seeing a considerable rise in COVID hospitalizations more than 99% of which are from non-vaccinated people. Together, these are just two examples of how good, honest, trusting people often fall for lies and disinformation that prey on their fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So let's please all keep an open mind when you hear something that you may not like. And please embrace facts over fears, truth over lies, and people over politics and join me in singing Accentuate the Positive. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Councilmember Baker. Councilmember Hennon. Yes, uh, the tree board in our last meeting made recommendations for 10 new trees to be planted at Oxford Park. The final details are being worked out, uh, but we should see those by next spring. Uh, they've also completed a communications plan. Uh, this is to help re educate residents on the do's and the don'ts and the whys of tree management in the city and to share success stories. Um, it's also to serve as a gentle reminder so we can get ordinance compliance without having to resort directly to going to code enforcement. 
Um, as of July 12th, there have been 372 requests made for the 200 uh, free trees we have available for the fall planting pr program. Um, those that don't make the list, they will be put on the head of the list for next year. Uh, and the tree board's next meeting is scheduled September 13th. Uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals heard two cases. Uh, in one, they approved a small addition to a home that extending outside of the allowed setback uh, because of the historic placement of the home before our current zoning ordinances. But they tabled a similar request due to the fact that the applicant also requested uh, a significant increase in the allowed lot coverage. And the ZBA have asked that the applicant come back with a proposed alternative at their next meeting. Their next meeting is Tuesday, August 10th, not the usual Monday because that conflicts with the day that our meeting is on the 9th. So as mentioned earlier tonight, at our last council meeting, we approved a settlement in the lawsuit over a ZBA denial and in effect overturning the ZBA's lawful decision. I voted against it because it's bad policy and against the intent of Michigan state law to give the ZBA independence from council. At the ZBA meeting, most of the members shared similar sentiments and then even though I disagreed with council's decision, I attempted to explain uh, that uh, council as a body felt that they could hold themselves to a different standard. Uh, despite this explanation, they couldn't understand why council would have its own set of rules and why we wouldn't give the ZBA legal support. And they were also just extremely disappointed that they weren't included in the deliberative process. Two very strong members, Steve Allen and Chair Paul Evans resigned over the lack of support and what they felt was unprofessional treatment. I believe there's still an opportunity to keep them as members of the board, but it would likely require action from each of you. I'd urge you to not just contact Mr. Allen and Mr. Evans, but each ZBA member so you can have a frank discussion on your decision-making process. I don't think it's necessary for you to come to an agreement but I do think it's necessary to have a dialogue to help heal the rift between council and the ZBA. No matter what words we say up here, the ZBA has seen our actions and they don't feel like they have our support. I think there's two lessons that we can be learned from this. The first is we should include the body whose decision is being challenged in our deliberations. It can only give us, be to our benefit that we get that additional uh, context and that additional detail. And the second is if we find an unjust law, we should go through the proper planning process to modify the law and not bow to legal bullying. We had the recent case of Vibe Credit Union who wanted to add landscaping to their parking lot, but this would reduce their parking below the ordinance requirements and they were properly denied. However, our parking requirements for banks are too stringent, a byproduct of banking from decades ago. So instead, the city went through the planning process, starting with the planning commission and with the opportunity for public input. And the result was to give the planning commission some flexibility in these parking requirements. And Vibe came back under the new law and they're now wrapping up a great looking renovation to their building. So following the proper process and with public input is the correct way to make zoning decisions, not by fiat from behind closed doors. Then the last thing I wanted to touch on tonight is the city of Berkeley vaccination rates. As of July 1st, for people 18 years and older, we have had 78% that have received their first dose and 74% of Berkeley adults have completed their vaccination. That's exceptional numbers. Just keep up the good work, Berkeley. So thank you. Council Member Gavin. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, planning Commission met and certainly a lot of what uh, they discussed was uh, what came before us today so I'm not going to repeat uh, what Aaron so ably talked about and, and Ben as well um, but the, they will meet uh, Tuesday the 27th at 7 p.m. and then the Environmental Advisory Committee met uh, July 15th and discussed whether or not to actually do a bike corral at the Art Bash coming up on September 11th uh, and the decision was made to do it and so if anyone wants to volunteer for a couple hour shifts uh, you can just contact me uh, at rgavin at berkeleymich.net um, we'll get you signed up. So it's like a two hour little window. All you gotta do is take a tag with a number on it, put it on a bike and hand the person the tag back. So it's pretty pretty simple work. Um, there was also discussion 
on a climate change resolution uh, that's in an early draft process as well. So uh, the next meeting will be September 16th at 6.30, and that's all I have. Thank, thank you. you. Mr. Baumgarten. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, nothing of real uh, significance this evening. Uh, much of staff's work is reflected in the packet itself. Uh, but I do want to thank those that uh, made getting us back to this point possible. I, I appreciate uh, Councilmember Price's comments on this as well. Uh, as we talked about how to safely return back to uh, an in-person meeting, uh, the conversation quickly turned to how do we keep what was good out of the virtual, uh, and that does involve having additional moderators. Uh, uh, Ms. Mathis was referenced a couple times. Mr. Liska is also uh, ready and able to provide support in addition to our partners at CMN TV. So uh, many, many, many hands went into getting us in this room this evening, uh, including one of our public safety lieutenants, Corey Miller, donating his uh, part of his vacation to put up uh, monitors to help facilitate a smooth meeting here. So. Uh, thank you to all those that uh, pitched in. It was, uh, you know, it's fantastic to watch public servants in action, um, and especially when you get to reap rewards like this this evening. So, uh, that's my comments this evening, sir. Thank you, Mr. Steering. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Mayor. And as others have already observed, I too am happy to be back in this format and the, see everybody face to face, and that you're all alive and well, rather than just looking at you in a grid pattern like an old <laughs> Brady Bunch uh, rerun on my uh, computer screen. Uh, I'll be talking to you in a few minutes about uh, some litigation matters, so I'll hold my comments for those. The only other thing I want to mention this evening is, um, as you know and as I've reported before, um, there have been legislative efforts over the last few years and again this year regarding um, short-term residential rentals and in particular to have statewide regulation which would essentially divest mm -hmm. local governments from regulating what we generally um, uh, consider in, in, in regard to be a local concern. Uh, it looked as though there was considerable momentum to, um, to finally enact such legislation which would uh, basically um, uh, categorize short-term rentals, which are defined as a, you know, a, a rental of 30 days or less, uh, to categorize those as um, permitted uses in single-family residential districts, which would effectively eliminate you know, any controls we have. Uh, but it appears that um, somewhat surprisingly there's been considerable pushback of late and um, uh, some compromise legislation proposed and even some legislation that's not so much a compromise but to uh, firmly codify local control. Uh, over such things. So uh, stay tuned. I think I'll be uh, reporting on this before, but what appeared about a month ago to be a done deal, ram it down our throat kind of approach, now um, there's considerable hope that um, we may yet um, be able to maintain considerable local control over short-term rentals, which haven't been a huge problem in Berkeley, but uh, is, is the manager and the community development director and I have discussed many times, it's not a problem until it becomes a problem and then it becomes a, then it's a crisis. And so, you know, we'd like to certainly um, uh, retain and reserve the, the lawful authority we've, we've, we've always had to regulate these local concerns just like we do with all other uh, local planning and zoning matters, this being among them. So that's all I have to report this evening, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Steren. Um, I too would like to thank staff for the changes that were done in this room. I don't know if it's reflective on TV or online, um, what was done to make sure that we can see everybody, that everybody has an opportunity to be involved. Uh, it seems to have worked relatively well so far to this point. So I am incredibly appreciative that we're able to be back in this format and we'll continue to do so moving forward. I have the privilege of once again providing an update from the Parks and Recreation Department. I haven't uh, been able to do that in about four years, uh, but in Mayor Pro uh, Tem 
Dean's absence this evening, I do have a couple of updates from the Parks and Rec uh, Department. First up, the JC Jamboree is this Thursday, July 22nd at JC Park. There is no pre-registration required. It is from 6 to 8 p.m., so feel free to come on over. The concert in the park will be held on Thursday, July 29th at Community Park. I want to highlight that that is at Community Park. That's a location change from uh, Oxford Park. That is from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Come listen to the sounds of the Royal Oak Concert Band accompanied uh, by the Woodward Avenue Jazz Orchestra. Please bring some blankets or chairs to sit on as you enjoy those dulcet tones. The next outdoor movie in the park will be on August 10th. Now that will be at Oxford Park. The movie begins at 7 p.m. and is currently TBD, but I'm sure it will be a, a, a crowd favorite for all of the youngsters and maybe not so youngsters that get to accompany those youngsters to watch this movie. Uh, and fall programming is now being planned, uh, so please stay tuned for more information on fall classes and registration information. Uh, additionally, and this is more of a reminder and less of an opportunity, but the public safety golf outing is this coming Monday at Red Run, and the reason it is not an opportunity is because it is absolutely completely sold out. Uh, there are two foursomes slated to go off on every single tee for the shotgun start, so they had tremendous um, excitement in wanting to be a part of a, like like many events we weren't able to do it last year um, and I'm excited about that and I think it's important to again discuss where the proceeds from this event go uh, not only lids for kids in the fire safety open house which I think most people are kind of associate this event with but uh, also police fire reserve uh, public safety honor guard uh, the Berkeley 427 hot rod and this year as well the canine program uh, certainly promises to be a, a great time, and Mr. Stern, I would ask that you please give my apologies in advance to Mr. Christ. Uh, he's, his back will no doubt be sore after carrying our foursome. Uh, you blame, you blame Councilmember Gavin, too. Uh, there's nothing, that we're, it's not happening. He's going to have to carry us uh, around uh, that day, but it will be a great day, and the weather, according to uh, Lieutenant Andrew Hatfield, is supposed to be absolutely perfect. And lastly, I want to congratulate and wish luck to Berkeley resident Catherine Nye, uh, as she will be representing not only Berkeley, but the United States in Tokyo as an Olympian weightlifter uh, in early August. Uh, good luck to, to Catherine. Uh, we certainly look forward to more formally recognizing your accomplishes, uh, accomplishments when you return. In a normal meeting, I would now ask for a motion to adjourn, but that is not the case. Ms. Mitchell, would you please read item number seven? Closed session, matter of considering whether to enter into a closed session for the purpose of consulting with the city's attorneys to discuss strategy and confidential attorney-client privileged communications relating to pending litigation, specifically Yellowtail Ventures et al. versus City of Berkeley et al., and Fire Farm LLC et al. versus City of Berkeley et al., Oakland County Circuit Court case numbers 2020-184751-CZ and 2020-184754-CZ. Is there a motion to recess into closed session? No move. No. A motion made by Council Member Gavin with support from Council Member Blanchard. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, Ms. Mitchell, would you please call the roll and in recessing into closed session? Blanchard? Yes. Gavin? Yes. Hennon? Yes. Price? Yes. Baker? Yes. Turbrack? Yes. And uh, just as a point um, for everybody here we will not be taking any action after this closed session we will simply come back to this room and adjourn uh, as we would normally do i don't know if we're live or not but i want to thank everybody for coming out back in the swing of things it's nice to actually see
problems here that some areas did. Some other communities are dealing with. Just Good to go. Okay. Okay. Give us one moment. Okay. <laughs> I got myself like it's so weird because I get at my preference. I look and I can see my eyes looking at this. So I'm like, oh my. Yeah, I just look straight. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I was talking to Teresa. I kept looking at her there, but I realized that Tyler looked very strange yeah. for her. She's trying to. She's getting a guess. She's like, oh, she's talking to me, so I'm making a shot. I will call our regular meeting back to order. Ms. Mitchell, would you please call the roll? Councilmember Baker? Here. Councilmember Blanchard? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Dean? Councilmember Gavin? Here. Councilmember Hunnan? Here. Councilmember Price? Here. Mayor Trebrack? I am here, and now I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So we'll support. Motion made by Councilmember Blanchard with support from Councilmember Baker. Ms. Mitchell, would you please call the roll? Blanchard? Yes. Gavin? Yes. Hennan? Yes. Price? Yes. Baker? Yes. Turbrack? Yes. The July 19th, 2021 meeting of the 38th Council of the City of Berkeley is adjourned. <laughs>